Good evening. I am David Rowe, the director of the Center for the Study of American Democracy here at Kenyon College. This fall, the Center, in conjunction <clears throat> with the Office of Alumni and Parent Engagement, is sponsoring a series of six online panels to examine the question, is the American experiment still viable? By drawing on the deep reservoir of Kenyan alumni, parents, faculty, and friends deeply engaged in America's democratic life. I am pleased to welcome you tonight to the fourth panel of our series, America in the World. Before we get started, however, please let me thank the many people who made this evening possible. These include Lindsay Colopy, Adam Gilson, Annie Gordon, and Kent Woodward Ginther from the offices of Alumni and Parent Engagement, Communications, and Advancement. I also thank Andrea Lechleitner and Professor Nancy Powers from the Center of the Study for American Democracy, along with the Center's student associates, Owen Fitzgerald, class of 22, Rose Fisher, class of 22, James Henderson, class of 23, and Max Onizorg, class of 21. Brittany Balo of Kenyon's Library Services and Information Support provided technical, technical support. Finally, I thank the many alumni, faculty, parents, and friends of the college whom we consulted as we put this evening's program together. We often think of the American experiment in self-governance as simply a matter of domestic politics. How do we best structure our government and its policies so that the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness promised in the Declaration of Independence, how can they be equally enjoyed by all regardless of their origin or circumstance? But the founders well understood that threats to human liberty and to the American experiment were not merely questions of internal politics of how best to put our own house in order. They were also questions of external politics, of how to relate to the world beyond our borders, and especially of our ability to hold at bay those malign interests and forces circulating in that broader world that might work to threaten or harm us. The Declaration of Independence not only argues for new government organized on principles most likely to affect our safety and our happiness, it endows that government with certain powers for managing the outside world, including the powers to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, and establish commerce. In the US Constitution, it is that we bring these powers together, uh, giving Congress, for example, the power to raise and finance a military and the president the power to wield it. As our recent history demonstrates, the more threatening and unsafe the outside world becomes, the more insecure the rights and liberties that we enjoy at home. The danger is not just that the government may seize our rights in the name of security, as when it interred Japanese Americans in World War II, but that we, as a frightened people, may demand that it do so. How else can one explain the widespread popular support in the aftermath of 9-11 for torturing suspected terrorists, despite torture's fundamental incompatibility with liberal society, human rights, and the rule of law. In 2020, we face a world that is becoming less secure, more fragmented, and more dangerous. We are now beset by substantial transnational threats to our safety and our welfare, such as the COVID-19 pandemic or the problem of global warming, that will require concerted interstate cooperation if we are to successfully manage them. Yet such cooperation has itself become more problematic. We also confront a world of growing mistrust and intensifying interstate rivalry due to the reluctance of the United States to continue to support the open liberal world order that it crafted in the aftermath of World War II and has sustained over 75 years. America's liberal allies in Europe and Asia are now contemplating whether they should continue to trust our promises to keep them safe or chart a more autonomous path to their own security, a path that takes a more skeptical view of American power, American interests, and American values. At the same time, revisionist states such as China, Russia, or Turkey have become increasingly opportunistic and aggressive in their efforts to expand their influence abroad, including through warfare, as they perceive America's power and ability to shape global affairs wane. Moreover, the Constitution recognizes that the threats to liberty from the outside world present themselves not only as enemies within our gates, or excuse me, not only as enemies at our gates, uh, but as efforts by outside agents to corrupt self-governance from within. The Constitution thus forbids any officer of the United States from accepting, 
I quote, any present emolument officer title of any kind, whatever, from any king, prince, or foreign state, close quote, without the consent of Congress. And in the past four years, we have witnessed this fear come to life. Not only have foreign interests and foreign states, principally but not exclusively Russia, sought to exploit divisions within American society and to disrupt America's democratic processes, but some within the United States, including the president himself, have welcomed these efforts and actively sought foreign assistance against their domestic rivals. This, after all, was the core charge that drove the president's impeachment earlier this year in the House of Representatives, a charge that many Republican senators accepted as factual, even as they declined to convict him. In some concerns about the viability of the American experiment arise not only from the many domestic challenges that we now confront, but also from our relations with the outside world and how these affect our ability to secure our safety and our happiness. To help us think through America's relations with the broader world and ultimately what this may mean for our security, our liberty and our democracy, I am pleased to welcome our panelists this evening. Chris Bros, class of 02, is head of strategy for Andrew Oil Industries. Before that, Chris served as staff director of the Senate Armed Services Committee. Catherine Denani, class of 81, was awarded an honorary degree from Kenyon in 2016 and is a retired career foreign service officer. In addition to various postings abroad, she also served as director of the Office of Regional and Security Affairs in the Bureau of African Affairs in the Department of State. Courtney Keeley, class of 89, is a correspondent covering foreign and national security affairs, including several years reporting from conflict regions in the Middle East. Thomas Sussman, class of 04, is director of risk intelligence at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Please note that the panelists this evening are speaking in their personal capacities only and may be, able to, and may be unable to answer some questions or address some topics. The panel will converse for about 40 minutes and then take questions from the audience for another 40 to 45 minutes. You may post questions in the chat accompanying the YouTube live stream. We ask to the participants in the chat, please identify themselves by their real names as a way of helping to maintain a constructive civic dialogue. We will try to answer as many of your questions as possible, but may not take them in the order in which they are posed in order to maintain a flow of conversation. Please note that our intention this evening is not a partisan debate or the scoring of partisan points, but to strive instead for a constructive, probing, and civic discussion that takes others seriously and seeks to generate greater understanding about the consequential forces at play in American democracy at this time. Our hope is that we all come away knowing more about this topic. With that, please let me welcome Chris, Kathy, Courtney, and Tom this evening. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks, David. Where I would like to start uh, this evening is, is, is really uh, with an understanding of the current foreign policy of, of, of the Trump administration. Um, foreign po American foreign policy is often described as that area where the president has the most latitude of action in the pursuing the policies that they, that they will. And yet at the same time, what we also know is foreign policy often confronts the president with a lot of structural constraints about how to best you know, pursue American interests in a world that is, um, uh, doesn't change quite so rapidly as the ins and out of the American political cycle. Uh, so, for example, Obama's foreign and security policies actually had a lot more continuity with the previous Bush administration uh, than I think many of Obama's uh, supporters were expecting. And so my question is, is what do we know about the Trump foreign policy? How would you describe, as an observer of American foreign policy, how would you describe the Trump foreign policy? What are its centers of gravity? Um, how does it approach managing America's relations with the rest of the world? What objectives does it try to attain? Uh, and, in, and especially in what ways do you see it departing from or being consistent with the foreign policies of administrations past? Courtney. So um, I'm here in Washington, DC. I'll just give you a, a quick sketch of what I see. Um, not a lot of foreign policy and a revolving door of advisors, which is a problem because you don't have the consistency over four years of the same 
uh, defense secretary, the same State Department uh, head. So you have this gutting of the State Department and you have this rift in the military, not on what Obama is saying about the military, or, or but it's in the intelligence community. It's all these parts of the government that are more invisible to the average person. And so what you have is a one note policy, Trump made very clear. His first trip to was to Saudi Arabia, then Israel, then the Vatican. Uh, and so he has an evangelical base and a Christian base. So moving, for instance, the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem uh, was widely condemned around the world, but something that his vice president, many of his supporters wanted. His complete, uh, pretty much loyalty to Saudi Arabia is very obvious because his so-called Middle East peace plan is basically opening up business between the UAE and Bahrain, Bahrain being a proxy of Saudi Arabia. It, cannot, it can't do anything without Saudi Arabia. So you have Netanyahu, who is also much maligned by his own Israeli populace, the Saudi Arabians who do not believe that they're getting human rights, fundamental human rights met, and a lot of money. And so it is very crass. It's very much of a one-dimensional kind of grandiosity of I can give you Middle East peace. I was at the White House the day the Palestinians were a no-show. You don't have a, you know, you don't, there's no handshake on the lawn if the Palestinians don't arrive. Um, so I think there's a basic fundamental, you know, always is who's the person behind the curtain in the Wizard of Oz? Who's amplifying the message? And I think um, if leave out Mexico and immigration, that's a whole other, a uh, dastardly thing to get into that I can't really speak to, but I can speak to the Middle East. And this is all because he, the one consistent thread he's had is Islamophobia and anti-Iran and getting rid of the Iran nuclear deal. So this is a very much one dimensional, we will save Israel really for some of the second coming kind of evangelicals. Uh, we will ignore the Palestinians if they don't come to the table, we'll cut deals under the table. And even Trump yesterday said something that I found pretty telling, which was, he said, imagine if my kids were making money off of me. Imagine if they said, hey, dad, we want to build a hotel in Saudi Arabia. Um, I covered also the death and the killing of Ijmal Khashoggi, uh, who was a Washington Post columnist, who President Trump said to Bob Woodward that he uh, had covered his neck, so to speak, um, and saved MBS, the crown prince. I MBS, I just, I refer to him as Mohammed bin Salman out of respect. MBS is a little too rock star and not quite accurate for what he's been behind. So there's a lot of human rights swirling, but a very definitive approach for business first, human rights later. Um, and some people are really getting what they want and others are getting nothing. But it's, it's, it's furthering that Saudi Arabian, Iran kind of cage fight to the death that we're seeing in the Middle East. Okay. Uh, Tom, can I turn to you next? You know, sort of what do you see? So the president's slogan, I think, for um, quite a while has been America first in his foreign policy. I, I think in a way though, we can put a finer point on it and say it's really uh, President Trump first in his foreign policy. I think I'm reminded a bit of um, the perhaps apocryphal phrase of l'état um, c'est I am the state. And from the perspective of, I think President Trump is making decisions about US foreign policy in a way, a more exaggerated way, exaggerated way than a lot of our past presidents in that it's it's very transactional. He is, I agree with Courtney, viewing decisions very much through a domestic political prism um, to determine which issues he's going to invest his time on and which, what issues he is not. Um, and I see also um, in his approach, sort of informed by his uh, background in business, particularly in real estate, um, a, a notion that sort of no alliances are permanent um, and a willingness to really challenge um, what are our core sort of fundamentals of US foreign policy going back since the end of World War II um, and a willingness to, to test those, to break alliances in order to achieve um, some short-term benefits. Um, you know, in, in some ways, those things haven't been all bad. I think improvements, for example, on from NAFTA to now the USMCA have been positive changes that you should give the president credit for. But more generally speaking, I think it results in a foreign policy that's hard to describe from a philosophic perspective. Um, it doesn't have, I think, an intellectual anchoring in a way that we would talk about maybe an Obama doctrine or a Bush doctrine. It is sort of President Trump trying to make deals in a way that will result in the best outcome from him. 
in some ways, I think that benefits our security interests. Um, unfortunately, I think in many more, it's it's hurt us for the long run. Okay, uh, Chris, can I turn to you? Is this you know how you see things, or uh, you know, do you have a, a a different view on these matters? Yeah, I, uh, I I build on what Tom said, and uh, at the risk of being overly generous to the president, I actually do think there's there's kind of more going on here, even if you wouldn't necessarily characterize it this way. Um, you know, I think that if you, you mentioned sort of the continuities that existed between, you know, President Obama and President George W. Bush, and that's true and accurate. And I think kind of building on what Tom said, you could kind of take that general bipartisan agreement back really to the end of World War II, where for a manner of speaking, you know, there was a willingness after that, you know, uh, catastrophic event to have, you know, America much more actively engaged in the world, um, seeking to shape not just events, um, but actually building the security, political, and economic frameworks internationally uh, that leaders at the time believed would actually make conflict less likely, would be less likely to draw the United States uh, into another world war uh, that would ultimately sort of enhance the prosperity of the American people through open trade, openness of markets, um, and generally speaking through core alliances uh, would provide a balance of power that favored you know, our values and our interests. Um, and we fought over this, we argued over this, um, you know, we, we kind of corrected to one side or the other, but there was a decent degree to which uh, for the past several decades, there really has been something approaching a bipartisan consensus around, you know, what's variably called, you know, supporting an international uh, kind of liberal world order um, you know, an international system that sort of favors U.S. interests, U.S. values, with America kind of playing that linchpin role um, through its leadership, through its hegemony, whatever you want to uh, call it. Um, and I think what, what President Trump represents is the belief that that's been a bad deal for America. And if you go sort of piece by piece, you know, we're getting sort of swindled and hoodwinked by our allies. We're bearing the burden for their security, and they're not doing enough uh, to defend themselves. Uh, we're setting up trade deals that fundamentally are more in the interest of our trading partners than they are in the interest of the American public. Uh, and that we're doing far too much in the world uh, from sort of an aggressive diplomatic promotion of values, um, you know, on the outer edge of that, you know, the conflicts of recent years, nation building, things of that sort, um, that are fundamentally a waste of American blood and treasure leading to no fundamental good for the American public. Um, so again, I'm not sure he would sort of characterize it this way, but I do think there's kind of more going on here. Um, and what he represents is really a departure from that in a way that, you know, sort of President Obama began to sort of step toe a little bit, uh, you know, toward trying to correct that. And President Trump has really um, sort of jumped in a fundamentally different direction to, you know, as I would agree with the panelists, you know, much more transactional America as not an exceptional nation, but sort of as another great power sort of wielding its interests to protect its own interests and values or wielding its own power to protect its interests and values. Um, and, and not viewing any aspect of this international architecture or international order as sacred. Um, so yes, being willing to stress as alliances, get out of trade agreements, pull out of NATO, overturn uh, international agreements, et cetera. Um, and I think that, you know, the, the thing that needs to be pointed out is that he's not been all wrong. Um, he kind of got elected on this platform to begin with. And there's elements, as Tom kind of mentioned, where a correction was needed. Um, now, whether it's been the correction that we've gotten, I think, is up for debate. Uh, I would argue it's gone a bit too far in a lot of respects. Um, but, you know, there's, there is a departure here. And I think the fundamental question that our allies and international partners are grappling with, which I think we have to ask ourselves, is, you know, if a, if a Biden administration comes to power, is this thing just going to snap back to the way it was in 2009 or 1994? Um, or has this been a fundamental correction of seven decades of American foreign policy? And now what we need to think through is sort of, you know, what does this impulse look like in a post-Trump America? Um, to me, these are kind of the core questions, again, maybe being overly generous, you know, from an intellectual standpoint to, uh, what's motivating the president, how he's thinking about it. But uh, to me, these are the core questions for us moving forward. Okay. Uh, uh, Kathy, you've been uh, a, a, a long-serving diplomat who has had to explain many foreign policies over the course of your career. Uh, so how do you see this one? 
Um, well, I'm uh, liberated by my retirement to be able to uh, to describe it a little bit more frankly, perhaps than I ever could in my career. But uh, I I think I agree a lot uh, uh, with what the other panelists have been saying. I think there has been, well, first of all, talking about it as a policy is a, some something of a misnomer. Um, there may be parts of the world in which we have a coherent policy. But the administration did come up with a national security strategy very early on in the administration. You know, I read it, I printed it out, I put it in a little binder on my desk, I referred to it in a few speeches, and by the time I retired it was dusty and old and not being looked at anymore because it really had not very much to do with what the U.S. was doing in the world. Um, so I think what we have are a set of um, a set of beliefs that the president has about the way the world is working. And then at another level, and I think this is part of what you were getting at in your question about the limits on the extent to which a president changes things, we have a set of foreign relations that continue moving forward. We have that, and it's not just you know an, uh, a, a tanker in the water that doesn't turn quickly. It's, it's a whole flotilla that's moving along. So there's a lot of continuity. There are a lot of things that continue to go on, especially in places like Africa. But I think at the broad level. Um, I would agree with Chris that that um, the president was elected partly because many Americans viewed this post-war consensus as something that had been um, a trick, that they had been persuaded to go along with a set of beliefs, a way of behaving, and that they were losers in this system. And I think the other side of that, I think that was the domestic side, the international side, is I think we also um, built this international structure and nurtured it partly in the belief that, there, that, that this would become the aspiration of everyone. And particularly once Russia fell and the Cold War was over, you know, let's let China into WTO, they'll start behaving more as we do. Let's you know, embrace uh, and, and open up to these other countries and they will become more like us. And I think one of the things that has become clear in recent years and that the Trump policy or whatever you wanna call it, if it's not a policy um, reflects is that China has no interest in becoming like us. And the Chinese regime is not looking to get closer and closer to the American liberal democracy. Um, India, when I was in India um, uh, 10 years ago, there was a fair amount of, of striving on the part of India to be more liberal, but certainly there's been a backlash and that's moved in an, in an opposite direction. And um, Hindu nationalism is on the rise. So I think, I think that this domestic force was very powerful and disruptive of that um, post-war global agreement. And I think we also may have been fooling ourselves about whether or not this was just a natural pinnacle of human you know, achievement that we could expect everyone else to embrace. Okay, yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right, right? There was this assumption in, in American foreign policy that you construct this liberal world order and then everything falls into place and that you might need to sustain it for a while, but it wouldn't require, you know, sort of tremendous national effort, right? That it would almost, you know, sort of run on its, on its, on its own. Um, uh, and, and so, you know, can you describe more deeply what you see as the origins of this shift? I mean, so when you say that, you know, it, it, this, this domestic basis uh, just for a, a strong sort of outward oriented American foreign policy just left, I mean, what's, what's, what's causing that loss of domestic support in your eyes? And, and, and Kathy, I'll just start with you again. And, and I'm not sure that, that it's purely economic, but I think an economic factor is really important. You know, until the 1970s, the strongest proponents of free trade in the U.S. were the unions, the, the, um, the union movement. Our view, we, we were in an era when um, we were going to be the winners. If everything opened up, we were so far ahead that it was to our advantage. And I think there are, you know, there are plenty of signs that if you're an optimist, then um, then it's easy to embrace openness. It's easy to, to um, try to sustain you know, engagement. But once you become pessimistic about your personal um, prospects, and once you have, have seen things decline, it's much harder to, to maintain that um, sense that you can engage with others and that will be to your benefit. It's, you become much more protective, I think. So I think that's a part of what's happening domestically. Okay, Tom, is there something that you see going on here, you know, sort of domestically that says, look, we can no longer sustain this, this role. And that's one of the reasons why we're seeing this shift in, in, in politics, which Chris, if we you know, take his point, uh, may be due to more than just the president's, you know, sort of personality and personal view. Sure, I mean, I, I agree with Kathy. I think that the economics of 
particularly around trade, certainly have driven um, some of the lack now lack of consensus around foreign policy um, that we are seeing in our domestic political space. Um, I also think both political parties have sort of failed when it comes to um, political communications around the benefits of um, U.S. leadership around the world and the value of, of participating in multilateral institutions. Um, I'll use just a, a, a recent example, for example, around um, the recent decision to pull the United States out of the World Health Organization, something that uh, my current, current organization is quite focused on. Um, it's hard for Americans to under, sort of understand what benefit does that give us? Why do we need to be partnering with a group like the WHO to combat something like, say, the COVID pandemic? It's, it's, it's complicated, it involves lots of actors, it's just, it's hard to make relevant. Um, and then I also think one factor is, since 9-11, we have almost 20 years of war. Um, that has um, been very challenging. We've lost a lot of treasure. We certainly lost a lot of blood. And um, there's certainly a large segment of our population that looks at that, um, that time period and says, what did we get out of that? Um, and that's, that's hard. There's a lot of um, certainly um, strong feelings around that. And it, it, again, it kind of becomes a challenge for the parties and for um, political actors that are committed to US leadership in the world to explain sort of why, why is it important we continue this sort of international role when it results in potentially 20 years of war without a uh, great benefit for us in the long run? Okay, okay. Um, and that actually gets us to another point that I, I, I wanted the panel to, 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 to address. And, and Chris, I'll start with you and then Courtney, go, go to you. And that is, is, you know, a lot of that war was in, or those wars uh, or, were, were sold not just as, hey, you know, there was 9-11 and we have to respond to it and there's a security threat, but also that this was a, a way to bring democracy to places that didn't have it. Now, I don't, um, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit skeptical that that was the impetus behind, behind the war, but at least that was one way in which uh, it was both sold to the American public and one of the public justifications that we gave. Um, and so uh, I can tell you that my students now are much more skeptical about the idea of democracy promotion as being something that is what I would call an unmitigated good by itself. They see it rather as cover for, or often see it as cover for, just simply a, a set of baser American interests and values. Um, and, and so, you know, and, and so Chris, I'll start with you and, and then Courtney, go to you. Um, yeah, you know, should, well, well, first off, you know, you know, have we lost a sense of, of hope and value in terms of American foreign policy, that it is about something aspirational that other people can share in? Uh, you know, have people soured on the idea that democracy is actually, democracy abroad is good for the United States? Um, and, uh, you know, is it, and is it to you more realistic just to think, well, this is just a way of which we present our policies, but we really are just driven by American interests, right? That, no, we're just still fundamentally self-interested. Chris, I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll start with you. Yeah, so a um, few things to unpack there. And, and I guess I'd answer your question by kind of tying it back to the last conversation we were having. Um, you know, why has the American public begun to sour on these ideas. I think it's objectively because when you actually look at the data, as a friend of mine who works in, you know, the flyover part of middle America said, look, where I live, the American dream is dead. Um, you know, the, the, the premise has been for a long time that if I work hard and play by the rules, my kids' lives will be better than mine. You know, they'll be better off, they'll have more opportunity uh, than I did. And by any empirical measure, um, that's on the ropes. And, you know, I think for a large part of the country, that is the lived reality of the past 20 years. And, you know, we, we sort of go round and round as to whether this is a communications or a policy problem. And I think it's 100% uh, a policy problem, uh, which isn't to say that there aren't deeper, uh, that there aren't deeper problems at work, um, beyond which, you know, policy may, may, may really not be able to mitigate. But, you know, to, to your point about American values, I think, you know, it's worth kind of breaking the question apart a little bit. You know, I think all of what I just said sort of generally sours the American public uh, on sort of, uh, you know, more of an internationalist foreign policy. And, you know, it goes back to what Kathy was saying that, you know, it's like I've got enough problems here to deal with. Uh, I don't need to be solving the world's problems on top of it. Um, 
But I'd separate out the questions of, you know, people have soured on democracy promotion, but there's a question of whether it's a bad idea or whether we're just not any good at it. Um, you know, I, I think you can draw the conclusion from the past 20 years of American foreign policy that, you know, our record is rather mixed, to put it, uh, to put it kindly. Um, that doesn't mean it's a bad idea or that it's not worth pursuing. Um, is it something that uh, is inherently interwoven with U.S. national interests? Of course, you know, the American government's not an NGO. Um, we have national interests and those interests at times align with our values and at times they don't. Um, I think with respect to um, whether this should be something that we continue to you know, pursue in the future, um, you know, I think what we're wrestling with now is that we're living in a more competitive environment um, and that context really matters. Um, it was different in you know, 10, 20, 25 years ago uh, where we were so far ahead of the competition, we had less to worry about. Um, you know, we could be a little bit more willing to cake on uh, extracurricular activities or do things that we felt were in the broader self-interest of the United States. Um, I don't think that those things are wrong or not worth doing. I think that you know, what America stands for is the idea that you know, people's lives improving overseas are ultimately good for the United States. Now, how you help people improve their lives is a different question. And again, you know, our record on that recently is mixed. Uh, but with respect to whether it's something that we should stand for, um, of course it should be. Um, I think the, the question really gets into, you know, as you now begin to navigate this in a more competitive world where our national interests are more front and center, uh, where we are, you know, competing with authoritarian countries that don't share our values. Um, you know, I think this is something that inevitably has to get sort of washed out in the trade-off of U.S. foreign policy making, where, you know, we don't just always do what's uh, consistent with our values. Um, you know, we, we do the best we can with respect to our values. We stand up for things we believe in. But at the end of the day, you know, we are going to be motivated by a national interest, particularly in a time where those interests are more contested than they have been in recent years. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, Courtney, I'd like to turn to you now because partly you saw, uh, you know, in your years in the Middle East, a lot of the uh, effects of these policies on the ground. Uh, and so, you know, what can you add to the question of, you know, uh, you know, and Chris, I think has raised it really well. Um, and he's really raised two questions. One, should we, and two, are we good at it? And I'll let you take that any way you want. Uh, so I'd say maybe and kind of. Um, <laughs> should we? Sure, why not? Uh, are we good at sometimes? Sometimes not at all. Um, I think the problem with Americans is because we have a democracy where we rotate out leaders and their advisors, often some of those people that come into government either are facing a critical problem they've never seen before or they can't go back in history. And we do repeat history and we do often come off as hypocrites. We talk about democracy, but then we support dictatorships because it's easier to have you know, General Sisi in Egypt right now than it is to have somebody associated with the Muslim Brotherhood, or is it? You know, do we understand what political Islam is? I doubt it. Uh, do we, and that, and that brings down to like your students who are, have a much, their age, have a much more I, skeptical as a polite word. At the, and I think um, you should apply a skeptical filter to this because we have failed over and over again. Um, and what we did was we lost another decade of innocence after 9-11. Because after 9-11, when America was on its knees, we thought we were bringing democracy to Afghanistan. We championed the women of Afghanistan. Now we're cutting deals with the Taliban because we're trying to put Pakistan in place. We wanted the Palestinians to have their own state. Now we're choosing Egypt over, you know, but trying to have them check Hamas in Gaza. We're moving to the US Embassy in Jerusalem, which leaves Palestinians completely out of the equation. Syria is one of my favorite countries in the world. It's a wasteland, a graveyard. So is Yemen. Um, it's very hard to control either the Saudis or the Iranians, and they put money everywhere. But this isn't something that we haven't seen before because just by moving to Beirut in 1998, I thought I was witnessing history and being told Arafat used to live there. And that's where, um, you know, Jamael was when, the, when Ronald Reagan was trying to make him president. This was where the USS New Jersey used to fire on us in the mountains. And if Friedman's book, Beirut to Jerusalem still holds because he had this complexity of 17 different religions and sects that we went into without knowing how to deal with it. And uh, I've always said Iraq was not our Vietnam. It was our Beirut Redux. Um, and then it sort of rippled and blew up across the region and these sort of concussive effects. 
Uh, and everyone tries. It's not for lack of trying. It's not for a map. American want of democracy. It's not for the lack of people on the ground also not wanting democracy. You know, power and money goes a long way. It's hard to check that. It's hard to check just basic arms, weaponry, and dealing. Uh, but then sometimes you'll see something beautiful like the Carter Center monitoring elections or getting people to vote. And the irony to me now is that the last time I saw the Carter Center monitoring elections, it was in Atlanta for the governor's race. Like I do think, Chris, what other people are saying too, is we have this reflex of turning back in because the last 20 years have been so terrible here in the States. People are, you know, have their student loans, all these domestic issues that are not being fixed, based on healthcare, not you know, being able to pay rent or finish school, infrastructure problems. We have so much, so many problems in the States just with our own arms that I can see like the Gen Zers, my favorite generation, just saying, wait a minute, let's fix this before we go out there on some great exp expedition. But also when the Beirut explosion happened this summer, because the younger generation is so, you know, part of their limbs and their fingers are, are social media. I saw more teenagers and, and, and college age kids that I know, family and friends, uh, putting out the Beirut explosion and being connected in a way and me telling them that I'd lived a couple blocks from there and wanting to engage on that level, it's happening in a different way. It's no longer so far away. There's an immediacy to it that I feel like we can, that has to be worked on. Because while it's, we've always gone in not, not in my backyard, it kind of is in our backyard. There are plenty of my friends that came over from Iraq as refugees that have great jobs now and are American citizens. Like, there's a huge wave of people that are speaking Arabic from all sorts of places. The change of geography, where is, you know, what Istanbul is trying to be is like the head of political Islam. But again, what does that look like? Is it a Khashoggi? As you check the Saudis, is it okay that it's Islamic? Americans are terrified to even engage in that conversation, for instance. So, I mean, then, you know, and then China is a completely other thing. But Russia and China are involved in everywhere. They're investing in it and they're doing it in Africa. They're doing it places because they see the economic advantage coming up. They see that we're dropping the ball and they're going into all these places. I mean, when Russia walked into Syria about five years ago, I think it was, during the UN General Assembly with Sergei, Sergei Lavrov talking about it as they were putting their base in. So there's like basic logistical things and tons of people that I know who have 20 years of experience on the ground watching this, what worked and what didn't. It's just how do you, do you ever get it into a policy in DC and in Washington? Because what a lot of people is there's just this churn of corruption on the UN level, people getting burnt out on policy levels and you don't have that sort of civil discourse that could span generations, which I feel like I'm missing now. Like I can, oh, hey kids, I can tell you what Beirut was like in 1998 or, how I used to be in Herrera's car before they blew him up. You know, it's, it's, I'm like the zealot of, of car bombs and, and wars. I was there for 12 years and then a couple more years. It's like, I've been in all of these places. So it makes sense from the ground. It's not foreign to me. What's foreign is our lack of understanding or even being able to differentiate after, you know, 22 years later, 20 years later, we can't, people still ask me if I had to wear a shador in Beirut. It's like, no, there were bikinis there at the beach club. They were, you know, they were, it's like the basic things of women's rights. A lot of people just gloss over it. So I do think people want rights and they want to live the way they want to live, but it's closer to what we do. How do you regulate? Who's going to be involved? Who do you have to listen to? Not in my, you know, I want to keep my second amendment. That's really where it is, but we don't apply that to them. We apply it to us, but we don't let them to have their second amendment or things like that. Right. And so it's, it's, Almost a demo, you know, you know, we both decide sort of, you know, you should have rights, but and these are the ones, and this is the shape, and this is the form, and our policies will support that. So our democracy is messy, but yours can't. We're right. going to fix your democracy in the way we think it's going to be a nice, neat package, and ours is, you know, one big screaming fest right now. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, Kathy. Yes. Um, I just. Uh... You know, I was a Foreign Service officer for 30 years, and I do want to inject into this conversation the fact that I'm incredibly proud of many of the things I had an opportunity to do on behalf of the American people. And many of those had to do with promoting um, the human rights of the people in the countries that I was serving in. And I was very convinced every day that my efforts on their behalf were very much forwarding U.S. national interests. And I think um, 
that's what earlier I said something about uh, the, the, the flotilla, so to speak. So much of what we continue to do in the world in places, and I've never served in the Middle East, outside of the Middle East, outside of the headlines, continue to be really effective at um, advancing our democratic ideals. And, um, you know, I think one of the things we hear about a lot in the news is that the president has sought to negate everything that President Obama did. If Obama's name is on it, then he's going to be against it. But so I went just as I was thinking about this conversation to look up some of the initiatives that um, that were started during the Obama administration in Africa and see if they were still going on. And they didn't have Obama's name on them. And they are, you know, the security governance in initiative which we, in which we engage collaboratively with African partners to improve the governance of their security institutions, not a high profile issue, but something that is really important and can improve people's lives is continuing. It was started, it was, it, oh, some of the, in the Obama White House thought it was kind of a legacy achievement and that had me worried about it, but it has been able to continue. I think we all know, for example, our work on um, HIV AIDS with PEPFAR is something that has been continued through multiple administrations and through the Trump administration as well. So um, yeah, I think there, there are many difficulties. I also think that the American public is a very philanthropic people. You know, in Africa, the missionaries from American churches were everywhere before our USAID grantees were there. Um, the health system in Congo was a missionary system, and a lot of it came from the U.S. So I do think the American people are philanthropic. I think they they don't know um, what their engagement in the world, uh, how, they don't know how big it is. They over overestimate how much we're spending on foreign assistance, for example, and they don't know what's happening on a retail level and how effective it can be in, in improving the lives of people. But I think there is a fundamental support for um, positive engagement on the part of the American people, even though I talked earlier about pessimism. Okay, Tom, I wanna uh, turn to you because I know that you also have I ideas on this. Yeah, I'll just um, pick up on a thread that um, both Kathy and Courtney talked about. Um, Kathy, to your point about the initiatives in Africa, um, that are continuing, um, you know, over the course of administrations. I, I think, in part, that's reflective of the tremendous service that foreign service officers in the State Department and in USAID um, give our country. The civil service ensuring some continuity of these core programs and advancing them over time. That's a true credit to our sort of foreign policy um, system and establishment. Um, I think the the sort of warning sign I see a bit on this is. Um, a concerning trend in the administration of really kind of undermining these core foreign policy institutions. And Courtney, this goes a little bit to a flavor of what you were talking about in terms of we have a, a sort of revolving door of policymakers um, within the administration that makes it hard for any particular policy to kind of settle in and, and, and make progress. It's, it's not that other administrations haven't had that too, it's just been at a higher frequency, I think, within, within the Trump administration. And that's been combined, I think, with this a sort of active um, effort to undermine advice from the sort of professional foreign policy class, everything from the intelligence community and certainly all the controversies around that, um, you know, critiquing uh, real sources of expertise within our government. You know, if I was a brand new assistant secretary in the State Department, I wanted to know what was going on in Sudan or something. There's a cadre of people there that know about it. And I just, I worry that within this administration, there hasn't been a willingness to tap into that expertise. By no means are these institutions perfect, um, but they, they are, I think, um, a real asset to our foreign policy. And it, it concerns me that um, they, I think, have been really damaged um, over the past um, number of years. And it worries me that um, if that damage were to continue, it would continue to weaken our ability to uh, effectively advance our foreign policy um, as we move forward. Okay, okay. Well, I mean, you guys have pointed out, I think, a couple of really interesting things. One is, is and this goes to uh, that on the civil level, or right, that in terms of civil society, there are lots of links that continue to tie us to abroad. And so that, that, that world that we see is out there is, is, is not going to weigh, and we're going to continue to engage it on a societal level, which may well also provide you know, expertise on the policy level. Um, you know, and even in the policy world, in the policy arena, we have, you know, and, and uh, you know, you can think of it as, as institutional memory or the bureaucracy, or even as the deep state, but we have a set of institutional features that can provide continuity to foreign policy, even if you have 
the political leadership change from time to time. Um, but that brings up a question, which is, you know, if, if Trump, you know, to what degree is Trump's foreign policy a real departure from previous foreign policies? I mean, to what degree is he really trying to, you know, sort of move the ship in a different direction? Because if he, if it is intended to be a, a, a real departure, what that means is, is that not only, you know, does that policy expertise in some ways become less relevant, it also in some ways becomes a hindrance because it will be trying just for, you know, sort of bureaucratic reasons to push you back into the same pathways. And so you end up almost in the worst of all possible worlds, right? That uh, you want to change, you have no expertise and you're fighting with the people who, who do. Um, and, and so, you know, are we seeing, you know, is the Trump administration really trying to set a new pathway for American foreign policy? Or are you seeing this is just something that's just more to the nature of Trump himself, that he's transactional, that he looks at the world in transactional terms. He thinks about Courtney, as, as, as you started off uh, this evening, saying, you know, this serves my political interests with these constituencies. And so we don't really have a foreign policy that responds to sort of the external world in terms of external interests of the United States, so much as a foreign policy that is designed to, you know, uh, bolster a set of internal uh, political considerations. I mean, so how do you guys uh, think about that? Chris, I'll, I'll start with you. Yeah, I, I would separate the kind of the underlying criticism from the proposed solution. Um, I think that the underlying criticism uh, hit its mark. And, and I think that it's incumbent upon all of us in Washington, you know, all of us who've had a role in government and public policy making for a while to kind of look inward and say, wow, um, I think we, we missed some pretty critical things and failed to correct some things that were going wrong. Um, so when you, when you sort of look at this consensus that had, that had sort of grown up, um, you know, you had the you had the aftermath of 9-11, wars that we fought for a very long period of time with no discernible end game that was beneficial to the American public. Uh, you know, the financial crisis and all of the aftermath of that and trade deals that people didn't feel were beneficial to them. So I think his criticism of the quote unquote bipartisan consensus in Washington, um, you know, landed a few blows. Uh, I think that then sort of you have to separate that from well, where is he taking it? Yeah. Um, and that's where I, I think you do start to see, you know, it's 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 kind of more tied to sort of who he is, how he thinks about the world. But there there are also things there that um, I, I don't think are just unique to him. Um, and I think, you know, the real the real question moving forward here is I don't think we're going back to the way things were. I don't think that we're just going to sort of, you know, wash this. Uh, wash this away and, you know, pretend as if the last four years didn't happen in the event of a change of administration in November. Um, I do think that there is a correction that has to be made. Okay, if I can just stop you here for just one second. You've talked about a more competitive politics, the need for a, a correction. What's driving that? What is, uh, you know, what is it about the world that has changed so fundamentally that we're not going back? So from the competitive side, I think First and foremost, first and last, it's the rise of China. Um, you know, it is the emergence of not just a near peer competitor, but a peer competitor, which is fundamentally different. Um, you know, we talk about the Soviet Union as if it was a great power, and to some extent it was, but at the peak of its power, it was 40% of US GDP. It was isolated from the international economy, didn't really have a vibrant base of domestic technological development. Um, China's the opposite of all those things. Uh, China is a peer competitor that is integrated in the world economy and is, you know, a vibrant base of technological development and an ability to compete with us uh, for a very long period of time. Um, that I think fundamentally changes the balance of world power. Um, and it's something that is going to play out for a long period of time to come, I would, I would assume. Um, you know, it's not the only thing going on. I mean, we talked about the rise of India, um, you know, kind of movements afoot in Europe. Um, you know, they're, they're, the, the world is becoming more competitive because I think, you know, objectively speaking, America's share of global power is diminishing um, relative to other countries. And, you know, by, by its very nature, I think that lends uh, or sort of leads you to a more competitive international environment. Um, and, and in that type of a space, I think, you know, we have to be more attuned to competing for what we want to win. 
rather than assuming that, yeah, we sort of put an international order on autopilot and everybody, because it was obvious to them, is going to sort of sustain that um, because it somehow benefits them. And I think Kathy made the point well. Um, we've assumed for too long that we're capable of changing people who don't want to change um, and turning people into, uh, you know, to be more like us when they've, they've clearly made the decision that that's not the direction they want to go. Um, I think that by its nature puts you into a more competitive international environment. Um, the correction, I think, is largely born out of the perception on the part of a lot of Americans on both sides of the aisle that the past 20 years have not been a success for American foreign policy. And I think, again, you know, unfortunately for the people who've been involved in that, you can point to a lot of empirical evidence to suggest that they're completely right. Um, so the question I don't think is whether we're going to kind of wind the clock back. Um, I don't for all the reasons that I'm saying. You know, I think the real intellectual challenge is going to be, you know, what does a different kind of American foreign policy look like in the aftermath of Trump? Trump is a disruptive force. Um, he came in with a belief that there was a lot wrong, but not a clear sense of what to do about it. Um, and that's what we've spent the past four years doing. Um, but, you know, him getting voted out of office in November doesn't mean that his critique was wrong. And I actually think that's, that's largely going to sustain um, I think the really difficult challenge is going to be, okay, if we're not going back and the past four years weren't right, um, then how do we take account of all the things we got wrong and make some systemic changes that are going to address the problems that I would argue on a bipartisan basis to include the president, um, you know, people have been pointing at for some period of time. Okay. Kathy, would you like to come in? And then, and then Tom? Sorry, I wanted to unmute myself. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that is, I think it's very true that, that some of these things are not gonna change these other countries. The rise of others is, is um, unmistakable. I also think we are just a much smaller uh, entity than we were in the world some time ago. And we don't have hegemonic power. We're not gonna be able to, the difficulty, I think the real challenge for us is to figure out if we as Americans writ large on a bipartisan basis, on, on a public basis, are willing to, to engage in the world when we don't get to define the terms. Um, and I think that in a way, um, the Trump administration has taken exactly the wrong approach, which is withdrawing from every multilateral and you know, uh, every alliance. I think, I think our ability to engage and influence in the future is gonna have to rely more on multilateral and um, on alliances. And those are the things that have been weakened most in the last few years. So I think, uh, I think that's the that's a large part of the answer, but it's going to require us to approach this in a somewhat more humble manner and accept that we may not be um, defining the priorities exclusively um, ourselves. Okay, Tom. I'll just pick back up on what Chris was saying about the rise of China. I mean, I, I certainly agree that from a competition perspective, that is driving a fundamental change into what we have to think about um, from a strategic interest perspective. I think part of our challenge as a country in terms of how we deal about the rise of China is, you know, we're seeing this rise of this power and our minds want to go back to the Cold War, right? We want to think about how did we confront the Soviet Union? Um, they were the uh, other main power we were confronting at the time. We had a different set of values and so forth, and we were competing against the Soviet Union for dominance. I just think the case with China, and I'm not a China expert by any means, but it is far more complicated. Um, we are on one hand military rivals, struggling for influence with neighboring states in Asia um, and around the world. At the same time, we're enormous trade partners and we rely on each other for economic, um, our, you know, economic benefits in both countries. And we haven't figured out a way to disentangle that. How can we cooperate on some angles on economic issues, um, taking advantage of our um, competitive advantages while at the same time making it clear to the Chinese that we don't support their expansion into the South China Sea, for example. Um, it's a very difficult balance, and I don't think our uh, foreign policy um, establishment has, has really come up with the right mix of carrots and sticks and solutions to deal with a relationship that I do think is in many ways just more, more complicated than we dealt with with the Soviet Union. Okay. Now, Courtney, I'm going to give you an opportunity to come in if you would like. I know that this is sort of outside of, of sort of your core experience, but do you have anything that you would like to add on in, in this discussion? Well, I've been covering Trump for the last two years here in Washington after being overseas for so long and also being in New York. So I'm an outsider to Washington. 
um, which I think is effective in a way because I don't really think, I mean, Kathy, I totally agree with you. I think people are, are incredibly phil philanthropic and the best thing about Americans is they want to do well in the world. They come from an honest place. Uh, they don't want to be power grabbers and hypocrites. They want to help people. Um, and I do believe that China is complex uh, and it's going to require experts that really can pull those threads out of complexity. But right now, or really looking at is, you know, do you put somebody else's house up? Um, if your house is on fire, you can't go and help somebody else. And I just feel like some of Washington, and yes, Chris, uh, Trump said he was going to be a disruptor. And he is a disruptor. But what he's surrounded himself in, in terms of an echo chamber, an amplification of a message, is that you, Pompeo, um, Secretary of State Pompeo, or Mark Esper, the Defense Secretary, or the Chief of Staff, all support whatever Trump says, often we're fact checking in real time, that's just completely antithetical to any sort of policy. Wuhan, China flu. I mean, we're at this point where he says China, and it's amplified out there right now. And then we have, and I am in the media, so yes, blame me, but because of cable and everything, it literally is amplified on your phones, on cable. So all of this, um, this, erudite policy talk is not what Americans are hearing. They're hearing the noise and they're hearing a certain kind of noise that is so one dimensional and antithetical to even discussing what our democracy is about or how we would like to import it for others. And that's where we're at right now. And I do think it, there's going to be a change, whether it's in four years or whether it's in four weeks, not two weeks. I don't think we're gonna have a decisive answer then. But I do think that if you do have um, a group of people that know how to rebuild the, the structure that has been that they've been trying to take away for the last four years, Trump has not put one in place. So either he, if he wins, he and his people have to put something in place, not just break it down, or somebody has to put it. And it's not gonna look the same if they do a climate they address climate change, they're gonna to have to come up with something besides the Paris Accords, but they can build on it. They have to go back to the Iranian nuclear deal. They have to go to all these trade deals that you're talking about. So it's, it's a basic um, humble rebuilding in a different kind of way with a lot of different people that are gonna be in government because we have a whole new generation of people coming in. Um, so many young people, so many progressives. We saw that in the blue wave and we've seen that even the Democrats now are involving progressives. So a lot of people that are going to be politically active in this too, that aren't all the old guards. Okay. Well, and you, you, you raised something really interesting and I'm, and it, and it's also come up on the, the, the chat uh, feed, which is the question, you know, we're, we're now facing really sort of two, um, you know, very severe crises in the internet, transnational crises in the international system. The immediate one, of course, is the COVID pandemic. And then there is the problem of global warming. I mean, will these provide, in a sense, a, a problem around which you can rebuild a sense of international cooperation? I mean, this is, is this, you know, are the problems sufficiently large enough that it will compel cooperation, even in, a, as Chris, as you put it, a competitive global environment? And I don't know, Tom, I'll just start with you because you're in the upper left. So maybe I'll just, I'll take the, the COVID pandemic um, first. Um, I, I do think that combating COVID is the kind of problem where um, we cannot solve this issue. The United States cannot solve this issue by itself. Um, and I think that there are a couple of reasons for that. Um, one is just the, the science behind how transmissible the virus is. Um, you know. Certainly we saw the pandemic start in China. And if you just track how quickly it spread, even with countries putting up things like travel, and I'm not talking just the United States, many countries putting up things like um, barriers to travel and trying to keep it isolated um, in the increasingly interconnected world we are, that was, that was not an effective tactic. We can't just wall ourselves off from something like a pandemic. Um, so one, in terms of the threat of it, and I think also in terms of coming to a solution then, um, you know, somebody's going to find a vaccine, and maybe us here in the United States, and maybe one of our partners uh, in Europe. Um, th the question is really going to become: How do we ensure, for example, that the vaccines are not just um, distributed equitably here in the United States? It's also important for our own self-interest to make sure that the vaccines are distributed broadly um, in countries around the world, including throughout the developing world, to make sure that, for example, 
Um, the pandemic is taken care of in those places as well, and it does not come back again to the United States. All of these things are things where, um, you know, it, it is not within our own sort of unilateral power to, to solve the issue. We're going to have to work collaboratively um, with certainly with our allies, potentially with our adversaries to try to confront this um, pandemic and ensure that it does not hang around longer, longer than it has to. Um, and I think that that sort of mentality of that kind of cooperation, um, it's not something I've seen sort of advocated from the administration to date. Um, and so we'll, you know, we'll to use a Trump phrase, we'll see what happens. Um, but um, it's, it's important um, that we get our, handle, our, our heads around that because otherwise um, this is the kind of problem that will just will linger on and linger on uh, much longer than it needs to. And, and Kathy, you're, you're a diplomat and part of what diplomats do is promote cooperative solutions is, is, you know, well, these kinds of, 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 you know, global transnational threats, do they provide a basis on which we could, you know, sort of work back to even within a competitive environment, a, a, a more cooperative uh, relationship with the rest of the world? Uh, absolutely. I mean, and I think, I think climate change, I, I think, uh, uh, yes, these, these two are great examples. Um, and I think that that um, there is there is no alternative. There really is no alternative to addressing this kind of a global challenge than concerted action with partners around the globe. I mean, economists talk about the problem of the commons and, and how do you deal with you know, external goods and, and with climate change, the only way to work is to work together. So I think there's no question that um, that, that has to happen. And I do think uh, that it is simply not in Trump's psychology to support that kind of activity. If he's reelected, I don't think we'll see it for four more years, which will be, I'm in California, you know, we couldn't, I couldn't go walk for a walk for two weeks because of the smoke here. I mean, just on a, on a very narrow uh, and selfish uh, level. We, we see that effect of climate change. And I think most Americans are aware of the effects of climate change. And I think there's a broad support for engaging to combat it and, um, and doing that internationally. I don't think will be a hard sell if we have leadership that recognizes the importance. And I think really any other leadership in either party than Trump would recognize the importance of global uh, action to combat climate change. Okay, Chris, do you agree that this is something that we can now build at least, or it gives us the opportunity to build uh, a more cooperative world? Uh, it's an opportunity. I don't think we're gonna take it. Um, Look, I think, you know, one of the things I learned when I was at the State Department is you can want to cooperate all you want, but if you don't have partners that are willing to reciprocate, you're not going to get very far. Um, the problem that we've had with respect to the international response to COVID, you know, was perhaps a breakdown of international cooperation. I would argue a bigger problem has been the behavior of the country in which it originated. Uh, it acted in how it believed its own self-interest determined, um, and that action or course of actions, um, you know, ultimately was was certainly to the detriment of the United States and, and other countries. Um, the question I think is, will it be different next time? And I think for reasons that we've been discussing, um, I, I don't necessarily think it's necessary. I don't think it's necessarily true that it will be um, in the sense that we're not going to change, you know, kind of how a country like China views its own uh, kind of national interest, internal security, what it's willing to speak truthfully about, lie about, welcome international cooperation on. Um, we should try, of course we should try, but I think we also need to go into it a bit realistic that um, our ability to cooperate internationally is going to be limited by the willingness of our partners to reciprocate or our competitors to reciprocate. Um, Climate change, you know, the, the, the challenge I think in recent years has been more on the United States. It's been our lack of willingness to reciprocate and cooperate. So perhaps there's more of an opportunity there, um, you know, in the years ahead here. But, you know, I, I think there's every reason to try and every reason to believe that even as we move into a more competitive world, we can find areas where cooperation is in the mutual interest of the countries involved, the major powers. Um, we've done that before. We have every reason to believe we can do that again. I think we just have to be, you know, very uh, kind of clear eyed about the things that will limit our ability to cooperate with other countries are not always uh, things that the United States does or does not do. It will also be choices that very powerful countries make for reasons that we're not going to agree with, but they're going to make those decisions nonetheless. Uh, and it's going to limit our ability to build a more cooperative response to transnational problems like, uh, you, know, uh, you know, pandemic disease or climate change. 
Okay, and 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 this actually raises you know two interesting questions. And so, Courtney, I'm going to start with you. So so listen carefully. Uh, um, and 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 one question concerns American leadership, right? Um, one of the criticisms has been that the United States has abandoned leadership. Um, and so, you know, even if we're trying to, you know, create, you know, does American leadership play a role in a world that is becoming more competitive? American leadership in trying to, you know, put forward or mobilize uh, responses to, you know, sort of common solutions. Um, and then the second question is, is, uh, you know, so, you know, if we are in this competitive relationship with China. Uh, what are the key ways that, that you think we should manage it? And, and Courtney, I'll start with you on American leadership and you can take or leave China if you want. Well, I mean, I think China's been a problem for years. I mean, Nixon, it was his great big success story as opposed to everything else. Um, and we've always known that there needs to be some sort of engagement and quite aware since then that they weren't necessarily gonna jive with what we believed in or go along with what we wanted but that it was a relationship that had to be dealt with or handled, however it can be. Um, and so I'd say leadership, what I've appreciated is how many people, I mean, I could just count dozens and dozens of people who've worked for the CDC, who, who went to Africa during Ebola, who have delivered vaccines, who've delivered aid. And so I do think we have a wealth of knowledge that we can't underestimate of people that are, have, you know, have uh, several generations and then, the, the young youth uh, energy on it as well um, in terms of volunteers. But what we've had in the past is leaderships that leader, leaders uh, that have been able to engage and say they're wrong. Um, even George Bush, uh, as the Syrians call him, the son, because the father was the president before him. <laughs> That's how they see things. Um, he, changed his, he changed up his whole defense secretary and he changed his policy in Iraq in his second term. And I remember Britt Hume saying to me, uh, you know, the thing that, the, the great thing about America is you can't be president for more than eight years. The problem with that is that most Americans don't have the stomach for foreign policy. Most presidents don't until their second term because they're not focused on being reelected. So we have this inherent problem of if you are tough on Israel, if you do something that might be problematic, you might only have four years. And so, and now we have it, you know, Trump is a completely different story it doesn't really apply to you, but President Obama got on the phone and made those last minute calls before Paris, Paris Accords. He got on the phone with India and spoke for hours. But people getting on phones and doing that, you hear that. Um, that's not really what we have now. And often the first term of a president is a learning curve where the second term is where foreign policy, you see it, but then they're out. And that's what I've seen over the last 20 years. Okay. Yeah, Tom. A role for American leadership? Yeah, so I'll, I'll maybe focus on one specific example um, in the African context and bring in kind of the competition with China um, in that regard. Um, when I was in government, I spent a lot of time in Africa in both East and West Africa, um, areas where um, there was a lot of competition, both sort of spoken and unspoken going on between the United States and with China. Um, and, and this is an oversimplification, but a lot of ways that sort of competition would take shape is that the Chinese, um, their interest in China were, or excuse me, their interest in Africa were clear. Um, they were interested in um, natural resources, increasing investment there, um, interested in economic opportunities. So their engagement in a number of countries throughout Sub-Saharan Africa was focused on um, infrastructure investment, on investing in natural resources extraction, um, essentially promising governments that, you know, we'll invest in your country and the deal we'll make with you is we won't intervene in your internal affairs. And that worked great for a number of those um, regimes. Um, what was interesting to me, at least in, in some of my travels was, was, you know, hearing, I think, an opportunity for the United States um, from a number of the, those publics sort of yearning for more American leadership. And it goes back to this sort of promotion of human rights and democracy in some ways, I've encountered in, in some, some of the countries I visited a sort of a higher belief in the American dream than maybe even we still have ourselves in the United States. And a belief that there was a role for the United States through our history, through our advocacy for human rights and democracy promotion, um, that, that we could help make things better. So I, I guess I'm in a way heartened by that and heartened by those experiences because it suggests to me, and, and maybe it's 
it's less of a natural national interest question than it is a question around sort of moral values and so forth. But but there is this sort of, at least in some contexts, yearning or belief that that America, when we put our mind to it, there, there, we can help make things better. Um, and I think despite all the challenges and, and we've spoken a lot about them so far tonight that we've had in our um, sort of mixed record, um, there is, I still think, a, a, a belief around the world that, that when that we can sort of help improve the overall security and, and safety of the world. It's just the trick of, of how do we sort of show those benefits back home, right? Um, how do we demonstrate to the American people that when we help increase the security of the sort of global order through participating in multilateral institutions and whatnot, that in a way um, that increased security globally creates sort of some freedom of action, I would call it, um, for us to be able to focus on some of our problems here internally in the United States, right? Kind of back to fundamentals, you have to have a, a certain base level of security and safety um, to be able to sort of focus on other things. And I think in a lot of ways, we've benefited a lot from a stable um, foreign policy picture to be able to make some of the investments domestically in the United States. And, and we have to sort of sustain that to be able to confront some of the challenges we have domestically. Okay, so that's a, I mean, that's an interesting sort of reversal of, you know, sort of the standard critique, right? We should be less engaged abroad so that we can be more engaged at home. Uh, because what you're saying is, no, 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 if we're less engaged in broad, then we don't have the luxury of being more engaged at home, if, 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 if I understand what you're saying. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I, I do think that's the point. And, and um, I think a lot of the core things that we've We've built up since the end of World War II, everything from NATO and so forth, right? Um, core, core sort of institutions. You could even say U.S. involvement in um, large trade institutions, uh, WTO and so forth, right? We've helped set the rules of the game, I think. Um, and uh, we've helped define the system in such a way that it, it does benefit. It certainly there's a national, national interest reason to do that. But there's an, and also it's a reflection of our values and the way that we think the world should work. Um, and I do think that benefits us. It provides a, a, a benefit that is admittedly hard to quantify sometimes, but gives us an ability to focus on issues domestically in a way that I, I don't know if we would have if we were as um, if we were competing more and would face a, a less secure international picture. Okay, Catherine, would, would you like to come in? I, I find it very interesting. I do agree that um, that our success engaging in support of our values internationally is a benefit to us domestically. I also think though that, um, that and, and I have experienced that same appetite for American leadership around the world and that same uh, belief in what the US stands for. Um, I think that that's been to some extent squandered and undermined in recent years and in particular in recent months. And I think that what happens here domestically, so I'm gonna turn back to the conventional a little bit on things like the racial justice agenda are going to have something to say to whether or not people are willing to let us exercise leadership internationally. Um, I think that, that, that the kind of moral authority that uh, we came from, you know, that we thought we came from at least uh, for many years has, has eroded over time, but particularly in recent months. And that's why I personally think that we need to um, engage and continue to engage in these areas, but to do it in partnership with our like-minded uh, partners. So, um, and that's, that that will make us more effective. Okay, Courtney, I noticed, I noticed you nodding a little bit there. Yeah, um, I think the most heartening thing on the ground is always how people talk about America. They might have a love hate of it, but they're fascinated by it and they know that they, they do want this idea of democracy that, we, that we've always been known to have. So, you know, the Brits really just don't like us, but everybody else likes us. <laughs> so um, I, I do think that there's, there's a level of engagement that's important. And I do think what we're also missing is how much, America, uh, how much everyone is watching America. They're watching the Black Lives Matter. They're, 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 um, it's big stories all over the world. Uh, Trump is the biggest news on television internationally. They don't know what's happening and they're confused and they are looking for leadership and a partner that they always expected to have whether they liked us or not. And I think that there's a, a, a big chasm right now of how do you guys have the most COVID? What's happening there? If we don't have America to go to, what are we gonna do? Because somebody said to me, well, I always knew that I could always come here if I wasn't gonna survive my country, but what's happening to you guys? So. 
it, it's a complex, like, don't be hypocrites. Don't tell me what, you know, don't get on the moral high ground with me. But we do believe that often you have one. And we'd like to be free in your country, but please don't, you know, please, what are you doing now? It's scary. So they do look for this leadership constantly. And I do think people are very confused by just the COVID rates, by why America has not been able to get this under control. I hear a lot of that. People are very, very surprised because we've always outsourced ourselves as the people that could help other countries. Why are we not doing it now? So the COVID issue, I think we're getting sympathy and disdain. Okay, Chris, I'll, I'll come back okay. to you. We a couple thoughts with you. Add, um, I, I think the broad question that uh, the, the folks in the world are asking is whether they have a Trump problem or an America problem. Um, you know, whether this is something systemic that is truly representing a departure for the United States that they kind of were comfortable with or they knew and loved or they liked or wanted to move to, um, or whether this is sort of a, a near term thing that is going to maybe not fully correct, but somewhat correct um, and, and start to look more recognizable to them. Um, we'll see. Yeah, you know, look, I think it's also um, worth pointing out something that hasn't been pointed out yet is that this is a really old debate, right? I mean, you know, we, we don't wanna get trapped in the novelty uh, of the present moment here. I mean, we've been arguing about these things for as long as we've been a Republic. Um, we don't understand the world. We can't find other countries on a map. We are hypocrites because we do things and then do the opposite. Our national interests often diverge. Our values and our interests are not always symmetrical. Um, we, you know, we're, we're kind of lousy at foreign policy at times. Um, and I think this is something that's not going away. Um, and I think it's just kind of incumbent upon us to not get swept away with the belief. And I'm not saying anybody on this panel is, but, you know, listening to a lot of what I hear in the country is this sort of, um, almost an ahistorical approach to this, which is a lot of these problems are pretty old. Um, a lot of it comes back to sort of wrestling with America's position in the world, um, particularly now as we move into a very different and kind of competitive environment. And, you know, I think in that type of an environment, it's incumbent upon us to be a little bit more honest uh, in, in how we manage these problems, both in how we talk to the world and how we talk to ourselves. Um, you know, I think that we've gotten a little too carried away in saying that everything we're doing internationally is somehow in America's self-interest when actually, you know, perhaps over a long enough period of time, you know, the values and interests converge in a way that it is in our kind of narrow self-interest. Um, but when you kind of look at the, the policies that were talked about earlier with respect to the response to HIV AIDS in Africa, I think the far more compelling answer that resonates with the American public is it's just the right thing to do. Um, this is what a great country does. You know, this is what a generous country does. Um, and I think that people accept it on those terms and they, they find it more honest and they're more supportive of it on those terms. Um, and I think that where we are doing things that are in our national interest, we need to be a bit more, uh, a bit more honest about that as well. Um, you know, it's, it's going to be, uh, you know, it's going to be that interests and, and values are going to diverge for us, I think, more in the future than they have before. Um, I think we have to be a little bit more honest in how we navigate that um, and not sort of create a sense of, uh, you know, kind of high expectations that everything we're doing is somehow in uh, our and the world's enlightened self-interest, um, lest that, you know, ultimately kind of get mugged by reality, uh, which it will. Um, and then we end up sort of looking even more the hypocrite. So, you know, I think we have to manage this a little differently and better than we have in the past, you know, lest we open ourselves up to the types of criticisms that are very old and are, and are going to come our way anyway. Um, it's a question of, you know, whether we can minimize the degree to which they do. Okay. All right. So there's, there's a, a, a concern that, that in, in some ways echoes that, uh, that has come up on the, on the chat. Um, and it is, you know, you know, if the Pax uh, Americana is, is, is ending, if, if what we're seeing is even if there is this demand for American leadership, the United States may not be able to supply it, is one way to think about it. If these, uh, you know, if, you know, uh, the Pax Americana is eroding or is ending, are we now looking at a world that is going to be more dangerous and more turbulent. I mean, when you guys look to the future, what do you see? Um, uh, Kathy, I'll start with you. And um, I have to tell you, that's the hardest. Uh, that's the hardest question for me. I have a very hard time looking in my crystal ball and, and seeing where this is coming um, together. I do not think that um, that the lack of a 
foremost role for the US internationally is necessarily a bad thing for the world or necessarily means greater, um, greater conflict uh, and, and a more difficult time um, sustaining a, a secure and prosperous future. Um, I think a lack of American engagement in the world would be a much more serious and troubling uh, proposition. And I really don't see that happening. So I guess I'm modestly optimistic. Modestly optimistic. Uh, Tom. I agree with Kathy. This is like a super hard question to um, figure out. I mean, on the one hand, um, my current distant boss, Bill Gates, talks about this some too, where where if you look at some of the core development indicators, you know, compare now versus say 50 years ago, um, in many ways the world has made just incredible progress. Um, not necessarily because of the United States, but we're we're uh, everything from infant mortality to um, dollars earned per day. I mean, we've made a lot of progress and I think that progress is, is continuing and is a hopeful thing to look at. Um, you know, does, does the, the sort of America's diminished world um, leadership role necessarily mean we'll have more conflict? It, it doesn't, I think, have to be that way. I do think increasing competition uh, between the United States, China, and Russia um, is um, a threat to that and could uh, rear itself in, in other conflicts. But I don't know. I think it, it's, it's a very difficult picture, but I, I think there is reason for hope. It's reason for hope beyond just our, our own sort of leadership role, but reason for hope if you look just in a, a larger historical picture about the progress we have, we have made over the past um, 50 years. Okay, Chris? Am I optimistic? Um, not particularly. Uh, I think that the, I think we're in for some rough sledding in the future. Um, I think the world is going to become more competitive in a way that most Americans haven't fully, you know, kind of grasped and wrestled with. Um, and I'm not sure bringing this back to America um, and particularly our uh, current state of our politics in Washington going far beyond the occupant of the incur you know, current White House. Um, I, I, I'm not sure that we're sort of set up to really deal with that. Um, you know, I think there's a lot about us to me right now that strikes me as fundamentally unserious um, about you know, what the stakes really are for us and the timelines on which we're really going to have to address some of these challenges. And when I look at a lot of American politics today, it still just looks like business as usual, fighting out uh, you know, our small partisan battles, um, you know, scoring small points in 24 hour news cycles, but not really focused on the kinds of problems that are bearing down on us, not just China, but climate change and other things that we've talked about today. Um, now, I, the reason I'm optimistic, um, and this is somewhat strange, is because actually systemically we've got good things going for us and our biggest problem is ourselves. Um, you know, we have a lot of money, we have amazing technology, we have phenomenal human capital in this country. Um, our biggest problem is that we consistently keep blocking our own kicks when it comes to, you know, our political situation in Washington. Um, that's the bad news. The good news is that that is something imminently under our control. The question for me is whether we'll actually control it, uh, you know, with a sense of urgency and on a timeline that is actually going to matter when it comes to being successful in this new competitive world. Okay, Courtney. Um, I wish I could be really optimistic and I can't right now. Um, I don't think we're gonna have a clearer picture of things until about February to see where we even are in terms of our own government here in, in, in Washington, DC. So until we actually know who's gonna be president and what their game plan is uh, and, who, and who controls the Senate, we're not really gonna see any of these issues being dealt with, including COVID. So we're in for a very short term, very difficult several months. Um, basically just to sort of take care of your family and your health and then we'll all emerge blinking next summer at some point when everybody's you know, got the vaccine. Uh, and so I do think that this is gonna cripple America temporarily in a way and humble them in a way, us in a way. Uh, but I don't think that's a, I think that's a temporary setback. Also the economy is one of the most important things. So it's gonna have to be a dual, dual combination. But I do think that we underestimate the young, the youth and how multicultural they are and how many of them look to other parts of the world that maybe we didn't when, well, at least I didn't when I was young. I just think we have a much more diverse population um, that's, that's coming of age. And, 
under 30. And I think that's going to shape the demographics of America. I think it's already shaping policies in Texas and other places, Arab Americans, um, the, the, you know, just for me being in the Middle East, it's just people understanding Islam and um, it becoming very natural uh, and, and just our own reckoning with, with racism. So I think some of the reckonings we're having here uh, will be viewed as sympathetic to other, by others who do want America to succeed. Um, and that as long as we are able to just kind of get through it and not put blinders on and not try to carry this mantle of American exceptionalism, uh, but that we're all here to help, you know, and not to be too kumbaya about it, but it has to be, there is a reckoning, there's a humbling and it's coming now. And then we're just gonna have to see how we fight our way out of it. Okay. I, I, um, uh, we're, we're rapidly approaching the witching hour. And, and so to conclude, and by the way, it's just been a fascinating discussion and I could, I could go all night, um, but I won't. Uh, we started this evening by saying, you know, often in foreign policy, uh, the president, because they face such structural constraints in terms of our interests, in terms of our relationships in the broader world, that we see foreign policy actually not changing very much from administration to administration. One way of turning that around is saying, you know, uh, you know, regardless of what president you have, it doesn't really matter in terms of what foreign policy you get. Uh, where I would like to end this evening is to say, because we're two weeks away from a very uh, what I think most of us recognize is a consequential choice in, in, in American democracy. Will it make a difference uh, for us, for the future, for you know, sort of what the future of you know, the international system looks like? Uh, will that choice we make in two weeks make a difference both for America's relations with the rest of the world and what kind of world we see? And uh, is there anyone who would like to start? <laughs> or I'll just call on people. Kathy, we'll start with you. <laughs> um, I think it will make a tremendous, profound uh, difference, um, partly because it will affect how we engage in the world. But I think more importantly, it will make a tremendous and profound difference for what happens here domestically in the U.S. And what happens here domestically in the U.S. is incredibly important for, uh, for what happens, how we engage with the rest of the world and how the rest of the world views us and our ability to re-exert leadership. So yes, I think it is momentous and important um, for, for, for our role in the world. Okay, Chris? Uh, I do. I, I think it's a pretty significant uh, event. And I think the divergence, you know, in terms of which each, which direction each administration could go in, kind of the alternative futures are, are pretty stark. Um, so I do think it's a consequential choice. I do think that there will be a lot of implications here. Um, you know, I think the, the, the opportunity here, and I've sounded pessimistic tonight, the opportunity here is if there is a change of administration, um, we will have a moment to capitalize on uh, an opportunity to try to reset things in a positive way, not meaning that they're going to go back to the way they were, you know, four, eight, 10, 12 years ago. Um, but to sort of take all of this uh, challenge that we've been through in recent years and say, you know, what's great about America and the reason that people look up to America and still, I think, um, envy America um, is not because we are without problems. Um, we've, we've obviously made it pretty apparent over the past few years that we got our share. Um, it's that we actually have a system and an ability to wrestle with those problems uh, and, and come out the better for it. Now, we've done that historically. I hope we can do that again. And I think that if there's a change in November, December, January, um, we will have a pretty significant opportunity to, to really kind of hit the reset button here to use uh, a terrible old phrase. Um, and I hope we do. Okay, if I can just drill down for a second, can you just give me a little more content? So what would that opportunity look like? I mean, what would a Biden administration concretely, what would it do in order to capitalize on sort of this change, right? Because you said, yeah, there'll be, a, you know, the, there, there's an opportunity here and we can take it, but I wanna know, you know, what does Biden have to do in, in order to take it? You know, what are the kinds of things that you would see as essential? Yeah, I mean, there, there's sort of like a long litany of foreign policy proposals that I could offer. I think the bigger one actually has to do with our domestic situation here. Um, I think it's the ability to start really wrestling with some of the problems that, that we have. Um, and showing that the, uh, that the president of the United States is trying to solve those problems rather than exacerbate them. 
Um, I think that we are, uh, you know, I, again, I could, I could list a lot of foreign policy ideas that aren't really going to go anywhere if we don't fundamentally start healing ourselves here um, and addressing some of these systemic problems that I think really are holding us back, both in our ability to be, you know, effective in advocating our interests, but also being a credible voice for our own values. Okay. Okay. Courtney? I think you just have to listen to what the candidates say. Uh, the one thing about President Trump is he says what he means. It's not, there's not, there's nothing confusing about it. And so is uh, Vice President Biden. Biden has made it very clear that climate change is one of his top priorities. Obviously COVID and the economy are going to be his top priorities. Uh, that he, he says that, he, um, you know, during his uh, tenure as vice president, he dealt with the recession and he was the hands-on ribbon cutting guy. Uh, now they're saying he sees himself as sort of an FDR kind of New Deal uh, figure, which would require a little bit of isolationism, but goodwill. Um, and I don't think from his past that you can see that he had necessarily strong or great ideas in the Middle East. Um, he was in partition in Iraq, for instance. Uh, Libya, you know, you just toss out a couple of things that aren't, aren't great, um, but he does know how to create policy and get people to vote. Um, President Trump is not interested in that across the aisle uh, uh, handshakes or overtures. He's very interested in what he has said he's interested in what he's done, which is promote Israel, his friendship with Netanyahu, uh, play a cat and mouse game with, with, with President Putin, um, decide that he's wanted to engage in North Korea in a way that people were surprised by, to put it politely, and to usually punish with sanctions anytime somebody goes uh, uh, across his, his line in the sand. So he's going to continue his more pro anti Iran stance. It's very much, um, you know, which is antagonism towards Iran. We've never even gotten to the death of Soleimani. That's, that's a very big deal. Um, so some of the things he says over and over again, like I got rid of ISIS. Yes, he did. He killed Soleimani. Yes, he did. That was very destabilizing. Is he going to get out of the Middle East? Most likely out of Afghanistan, most likely. So you can just listen to what he says. Um, and then decide. Uh, but, but Biden is much clearer on this sort of overall climate change, Paris talks, engaging Iran, diplomacy, and getting to the table. President Trump is sort of my way or the highway. And, you know, it's, it's just really what you think, what a voter thinks is the right way. Okay. Tom? You know what? I think at the end of the day, this is a question of of leadership matters, um, and especially in foreign policy, presidential leadership matters. Um, Dave, I think as you mentioned in your lead-in tonight, um, foreign policy is an area where the president, um, despite all the structural constraints um, on the power of the presidency, it is one area where the president has a lot of a lot of influence in terms of the direction the country takes. And I agree with what Courtney's saying. You just have to listen to the candidates to understand that they have fundamentally different approaches. They have different things that they're focused on. They have different um, uh, ways they choose to engage with uh, foreign leaders on policy challenges. And I think in the most fundamental sense, um, they have a very different approach when it comes to the, what I think is the single biggest challenge facing us right now, which is the state of the pandemic here at home. And if we're going to engage effectively abroad, if we're going to talk about sort of American leadership abroad, at some point we have to get past this immediate crisis. And I think there's a really fundamental difference in terms of how these two leaders are dealing with that challenge. Um, so yeah, I, I think this is a, a hugely consequential election and, and will, despite all of the structural challenges we've talked about tonight, um, it the choice of this election, I think will really determine both how quickly do we start showing effective American leadership again um, and, and, and just what basic shape does it take? Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, is there anything else that anyone would like to add? If, you know, something that you think is important that we've missed, uh, that really needs to be put on the table because, you know, I'm open. So, uh, uh, well, I don't see anybody <laughs> you know, chomping at the bit, but so, so let me say, uh, thank you very much. Uh, for what you have done this evening. I can tell you I, uh, from the, the, the chat that I see that there, the, there, there is a, a, an appreciative audience out there. And so uh, I very much thank you for the way in which you've taken a very complex subject uh, and, uh, and sometimes inartfully posed questions 
and made a, a really interesting evening out of it. And so uh, I thank you for taking the time. I thank you for sharing your, your insights and, and wisdom with us. It's been a, a wonderful evening. Uh, now, before we go, uh, a couple of things. Uh, and the first is, is I also would like to thank the audience uh, for their participation uh, tonight as well. There were more questions on the chat than we had the ability uh, or we had the time to answer. And so I apologize if we weren't able to cover some of the things that, 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 that you were concerned with. Uh, this will be, I think, an ongoing conversation. Um, uh, and so there are other things at the CSAD, the Center for the Study of American Democracy will be doing in the future that will allow us to continue these discussions. Um, uh, I, uh, and so what I would like to do now is just to thank everyone for the time this evening to really think about some issues of American democracy democracy uh, and actually our, our position in security in the world that are very important to us. Uh, before I, I, I finally sign off though, I would also like to remind everyone that this is the fourth of six panels that we have considering uh, is the American experiment still viable. Uh, the next panel will be next Tuesday night, October 27th at 7 p.m. Uh, in which we will be discussing the state of the fourth estate, uh, the media and its role in American democracy in a panel entitled uh, Information, Misinformation, Disinformation. We hope that you can also take the time uh, to listen in on that conversation as well. Um, with that, again, I would like to thank everyone for their participation tonight and to wish everyone a good evening. Thanks so much.